I don't know if I can take it anymore. When you are depressed, you don't want to get it out of here. It's so hard to do. You don't want to be bothered with anyone. I don't have any motivation. But overcoming depression is going to require that you get up and engage with life again. All I want to do is sleep. When you are feeling down, the worst thing you can do the last is thing I isolate do is yourself. With my friends. Because isolation actually intensifies sadness. I don't think this will ever so go I away. So I recommend finding a distraction that will shift your energy. I need somebody to help me. All right. Thank you for joining us on our mental health podcast. This is your host, Barbie Moreno, and I am very honored to have with me today, Brooke Braylove. She is a psychotherapist, a licensed clinical social worker. She works with the accelerated resolution therapy, which we're looking forward to hearing about. She also specializes in sex therapy, women's therapy, and happens to be a uh, facilitator for Bre Brene Brown's Daring Greatly curriculum. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Barbie. Really happy to be here. Of course, that is quite a list of qualifications to have you on our show. So we are very grateful for your time. Um, I wanted to start off with accelerated resolution therapy, and then we'll go into the different other realms that you work in, if that's okay with you. Of course. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of how this works, given that we are often, um, and, and of course, I know psychotherapists and psychiatrists are different things, but there are a lot of people, myself included, who are uh, have a hard time when we're prescribed medication. Sometimes it feels like a failure. Um, sometimes we don't like the way that it makes us feel. Um, and so I know for me, I've tried TMS, EMDR. Um, can you give me an idea of how this is different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So accelerated resolution therapy is a brief uh, treatment modality. Uh, it's evidence-based and it basically takes um, the distressing images and sensations that are associated with things like trauma, depression, anxiety, relationship issues, OCD, eating disorders, addiction, I mean, a whole slew of things. And it changes the way the brain stores those memories. Um, and so it is uh, sort of from the same, you know, vein of EMDR in that it does use rapid eye movement and the kind of bilateral brain stimulation that EMDR uses. Um, but it is an extremely effective and very rapid treatment. So really anywhere between one and five sessions uh, per sort of issue that you come in with. So um, the average is about, I think it's 2.7 sessions that someone will have complete resolution of, you know, whatever brought them in. Um, it's an incredibly exciting treatment that has re-energized me in my practice mm -hmm. and provided me and a lot of my patients with a tremendous amount of hope and um, just tr excitement. I mean, you know, I always tell people, I know I sound like a, you know, snake oil salesman. I get it. And I wish I could sound differently, but I can't right. because I believe in it that much and I'm not excited about it. Yeah, you seem very excited about it. And it sounds very promising with insurance companies. Don't we love them? Is mm -hmm. this covered? Yeah, I mean, it's coded as as a as a, a regular psychotherapy nice. session. There's nothing different about it in terms of that. So whatever your benefits would be for, you know, outpatient psychotherapy, it's the exact same thing. Um, sessions usually run about 60 to 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's just amazing. And so where I find it most useful, um, is really where people feel stuck. Mm -hmm. So, and again, people feel stuck in lots of ways and I'll share my own experience. I mean, the way I came to find out about art was after a traumatic breakup that I had, mm -hmm. uh, in 2017 and I was doing my normal weekly talk therapy and I tried a few other modalities and 
nothing would budge this, you know, sort of um, obsessive kind of flashbacks and ruminating. And I mean, again, I just felt completely unable to move forward. And so I, someone recommended this thing called art, which I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And I did two to three sessions and um, I, I moved forward. I mean, it was that simple really. And so it works on so many different kinds of things um, in a very rapid way. And so what I love about art is that the people who usually come to me are people that have tried talk therapy for years, right? And I'm a talk therapist. I love a good talk therapy session. Right. But I do think we're really learning so much more about the brain and the body. And there are limitations to talk therapy. And, you know, again, I think that this sort of human need for talk therapy will never go away. But I think you're going to see so many more brief body and brain based things kind of taking over psychotherapy soon um, because people are tired of suffering. Right. And the more they talk about it, it doesn't necessarily get better. And when you're talking about, you know, single incident trauma, kind of big T trauma, um, you know, when someone comes back from, you know, uh, being deployed and they have a horrific, you know, they saw their best friend being killed. Yeah. So what I find is that, you know, talking about it and um, being, ex you know, exposure therapy can be re-traumatizing for people. And the beauty of art is that there's very little talking. You can share as little or as much as you want about your trauma. And most people, they don't want to share much. So right. I like to feel connected to my patients. And so I do do an intake session where I do find out really specifically what's bringing them in. I have them usually, if they're willing to tell me their story once, and then I say, that's as much as we'll be talking about it. And they're very relieved. And so in the session, it's much more about eye movement and imagining something in their head, picturing the scene that's bringing them in the incident, the complex PTSD, the depression, whatever it is, and kind of holding that in their mind while they do um, eye movements. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is going to bring up distressing body sensations. And the eye movements tap into a relaxation sort of part of the brain. So while they're imagining this traumatic incident or, you know, something that's very distressing, they're going to have difficult body sensations, but through the eye movements that begins to calm down. And mm -hmm. when that calms down, uh, they voluntarily replace those images with images they want to have and hold on to. And then we pair those with positive sensations in the body. And then we store that in the brain. So with art, we say, keep the knowledge, lose the pain. You'll never forget the events of what happened to you. You wouldn't want to. That's part of your story, part of your life. So, you know, it's not hypnosis. Um, patients are fully in control of the entire session. Whatever happens, they're fully aware but they don't need those images and sensations. The facts are enough. Right. And in fact, it's not the facts that are disturbing to people. It's the images and sensations that come up when they think about it or when they, you know, get triggered in real life. That's what needs to change. And when we change those, there's just very, very little distress associated. And so even with me and my example, I could talk about having had a breakup, I could use the words, but I, you know, and I guess some of you won't be seeing this because it's a podcast, but well, what, it's, I, what we also record video. Oh, so yeah. Okay, good. So what is, what trauma or, you know, this breakup was like right here in my face, no matter what. And now, the, and, and the way I described it after art is like, I see you over there in the corner and I can talk about you, but I have no emotional attachment to it anymore. And so that is so liberating about it at all. Whereas you could be crying about it before now, like you wouldn't have the sensation or need to cry about the event. N not at all. And, and I have wow. to be honest. I mean, 
I cried for 99 straight days about this breakup. And I, I mean, that's, <laughs> I kept track. And uh, I think I did the art somewhere around like 97 days or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't cry after that, uh, you know? And of course, I mean, not never, there's still right. some grief or something, but uh, the, the charge was gone. There was no charge to any of it anymore. And that's what felt like I couldn't control was that just tremendous charge and then being triggered. Because mo most people will say, you know, I just want to respond differently when I get a nasty text from right. my mother-in-law, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what's upsetting is they go straight into fight, flight, or freeze. Right. And what they want is to just be able to be resilient to that. And when we work on, you know, that dynamic, for instance, with your mother-in-law and that, you know, we calm those sensations when you think about talking to your mother-in-law, um, then when she does text you, you're like, oh, that's annoying, but you're not. That sounds not amazing to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The mother-in-law doesn't like resonate because my husband's mother has passed. However, just there are certain people who you're just like, so if you get to a root cause of one thing, does it then transfer over to other things? So like, let's just say the reason why your mother-in-law causes that feeling inside of you is because you have your own issues with your mom. And it reminds you of that. Does that also transfer like psychotherapy and talk therapy? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I would say it, it, you can kind of approach it in a few ways. So one thing that happens is, uh, let's say somebody comes in and they have an eating disorder and they just, they want to work on their eating disorder. Um, sometimes what we'll do is if things aren't quite going the way I would expect in a session, um, we might ask their brain to think about like what else this might remind them of or something. And then that um, can be what we end up working on, like an earlier time or in their lives where they felt that. So they do link. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, like any trauma or any relationship pattern, like in psychotherapy, you're going to want to go back and think about when did that start mm -hmm. and what did that feel like in the, in your body? Um, the amazing, wonderful Lainey Rosenzweig, who is the creator of art. She created art in 2008. Um, I was on a, you know, a sort of a training call or a, you know, a Kate's consultation call with her the other day. And she said, I can knock out a whole childhood in one session. And so, and you know, Sign she, me up. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, literally. And she, yeah. you know, I think the rest of uh, the practitioners on the call were like, gosh, I can't wait till I feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that I'm at the place where that's the, um, but we can just throw a bunch of stuff together and work on all of it at the same time. And that seems like exactly what you said in the beginning. People are tired of suffering. We just want to live our lives. We don't want to sit there and reminisce about the past. And, and like for, I've done a lot of work, right? I mean, years and years and years and years of like self-discovery and this and working through my stuff and all that stuff. And the event still bring up, like they, they will still make me cry. In fact, I did something yesterday and I was talking about something that had happened in my past, which I totally understand this part of my story, mm -hmm. right? But it still brought tears to my eyes. It still mm -hmm. brought those emotions and my lips quivering, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, how many times do I tell this story? Why am I still crying about it? Yeah. And again, that's like exactly what art is sort of made for is that you want to have a different response. You want to dull the response. You don't want to have your body go into that state mm. that feels so out of control, right? Like, you know, they're spontaneous and, you know, your heart beats or your tears come or your lip quivers or whatever. People want to feel like they have more control over that. And art allows that a hundred percent. So this is interesting because I just did a podcast with a gentleman who was uh, like a special agent for the United States and he had been in lots of different things. And what he, he does as part of his practice, which is, this feels like he's actually doing it the opposite way that he should, knowing what you're talking about, is he will put himself in situations that bring up the anxiety so he can then learn to conquer the anxiety, right? So what you're saying is basically that for me, it sounds like he's almost re-traumatizing 
himself over and over again. And because his idea is like, if I can conquer this, then it won't be able to control me. It's almost like what it actually is doing is continuing to bring up those body sensations that are bringing it back to real life. True. Yeah. So again, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not here to knock any other type of therapy, but what comes up for me in that case is that's just exposure Mm -hmm. without the desensitization. And as Lainey, Lainey calls it what we, what we do in art positization, Mm -hmm. it's not just desensitizing yourself. It's then adding something positive to it. So my question for, for that gentleman would be, so you're exposing yourself, but what else is happening? Are you doing calming eye movements? Is someone leading you through calming your body? Because just exposure, I would argue is torture. Right. And that's what it sounded like for me. Cause so he does it on his own. He's not a psychotherapist. Right. Um, and so he does it on his own and his idea behind it is like, let me bring up all of my, my anxiety about that moment. And he literally says, let me trigger the anxiety. Right. So he wants to trigger the anxiety and then do whatever practices he's taught himself to get better. Right. So whether Mm -hmm. it be breathing or whatever, and Mm -hmm. again, everybody has their own technique, but if you have something that will help you so that the anxiety doesn't even come up when you think about it, Mm -hmm. I feel like that's way more healing than having to retrain the way that you react to it. Yes. Yes. I would. I mean, and it's a lot faster, right? right? I mean, you know, and now Um, you know, he could, he could do a couple art sessions and then, you know, he, he he probably wouldn't need to even do this whole process that he's doing. Um, and again, I mean, if it works for him and he actually starts to feel better, then that's wonderful. I mean, you should always do, you know, what feels best to you. Um, and you know, I don't believe anything is one size fits all. Sure. So I, I, I obviously cannot guarantee hundred percent results. The research, um, with art shows that it's 70% effective. My experience in my practice is much higher than that. Mm-hmm. I would say it's about 85 to 95% effective. Um, and you know, Art is not for every single person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, I, I think it can be helpful to sort of look at, you know, who qualifies for art, basically. Um, and so there are three, you know, main things uh, that we need to find out before we before I'm willing to, you know, to do art with someone. One is... Um, can they move their eyes back and forth comfortably? You know, is there any reason? Do they have a seizure disorder? Um, Is there, have they just had eye surgery? I mean, things like that. Most people can, they they don't have any reason um, not to be able to. Um, The second thing is, can they hold a thought? Can they actually hold a thought in their mind? And again, most people can do that. Um, And then the third, and this is a little bit trickier is, are they motivated to change? Hmm. Of course, most people, in fact, everyone says, yes, of course. And this is a little bit, um, and you're nodding, I'm sure you understand this, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, we can have parts of us that want to change and parts that don't. Mm -hmm. And we can really have, you know, something called a secondary gain. You know, what do we get from staying stuck? And I always tell people, I am not saying that you are consciously doing anything to get in your own way. But my experience is that if art is not really effective with someone in my practice, it's the, it's the third thing. It's that they are not quite ready to let go. And they're not aware of that necessarily. And again, that's the kind of thing where, you know, something that's familiar is comfortable. We'll always gravitate toward that. Not because it's good for us or not because we enjoy it, but because it's familiar and it's known. And those neuro pathways have been formed over and over again. And um, go ahead. Sorry. So what that brings up to my mind is that that is when I would imagine people make their traumas, their story. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I wouldn't want to get better if what my, in my mind, I have decided that, you know, my victimhood of somebody, let's say like I had a lady on who, you know, um, she was attacked in the middle of the night. And if they, then she then opened up a, um, 
you know, a, a nonprofit because of it and stuff. I would imagine if because that is what her story in her mind is about her, that 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 might trigger some sort of resistance because that's what she has now built her life around. Now, mm -hmm. on the other side of that, I look at that and say she can still still continue to do her nonprofit. In fact, she can do it better because she doesn't have the triggers and the emotions. But you have to look at it from a different point of view in order to understand that versus somebody. And I'm not saying she's acting like a victim in any way, shape, or form. This is just mm -hmm. an example, right? That that they have to understand that they are not their story. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's a hard place to get to sometimes. Absolutely. And this is where I love something like internal family systems work, IFS, where um, you can help the person look at the parts of them that are scared to move forward or scared to let go. I mean, she may be even worried that she would lose credibility mm -hmm. if this weren't, you know, sort of central to who she was. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think some talk therapy is really helpful, right? To say, you know, what part of you does really want to let this go? And is there a part that is really scared or how, mm -hmm. what will that mean? And I do see this a lot with chronic illness, because, of course, when people allow illnesses to become literally who they are, they're so, you know, sort of wedded to it as an identity, right? Rather than I am someone who has, you know, um, uh, you know, EDS or something, right. um, if so, whether, or they're an EDS or that's Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So, you know, how do you identify what language do you use around it really matters. Right. Well, and I would imagine, so let's say that I am somebody who has suffered from illness and I've given it a name and this is the reason why I can't do so many different things. And then all of a sudden I go to you and in two or three sessions, this is not a problem. I would probably be like, weirded out to tell people like, oh yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, your ego is going to take a huge hit because you've been making excuses your entire, you know, existence that you've had this thing as to why you can't do it. You go, you do this art therapy and then you're fine. And then, you know, it's kind of almost like, yeah, it was all in your head, you know? So yeah. And, and right. And, and this is where, again, we get, we have to be careful, right? Because Pain is pain. And right. it's not that it's actually not real. It's right. extremely real, but it has a psychological component. Mm. And so I think, you know, this is, again, I, I think this is, you know, a little, a, a little, it's just a hard situation because we're, we don't want to blame people for their illnesses, but we want to help them understand that if they can unlock the psychological part that may lead to greater physical healing. It actually could lead to the things you're already doing to treat it working better. Right. It's you like know? removing that roadblock. Right, exactly. And that's literally what we're doing. I mean, we're kind of moving a big boulder that's in front of you. And now it becomes a little rock that you can just kick down the road. I would imagine, you know, um, that this would be very helpful. It's, I would imagine it's very helpful for everybody, but for men who generally, gen this is a generalization, don't typically like to sit and talk about their problems. Um, either they don't acknowledge them in general, um, or they're buried deep down, or it's considered weak. Mm -hmm. I would imagine being that there's not a lot of talk involved. Mm -hmm that this would be something that they would more turn to than a traditional talk therapy. I think that's a very good point. And yes, we're generalizing and yes, it's kind of true. Right. right, right. Um, so there's um, a reason why you can generalize about it because it's right. Basically, yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, for men who are, you know, very uncomfortable showing emotion, you know, um, talking about things, sharing their story, they don't have to, and they'll still get better. I mean, I did one session again, as I said, I like to feel connected to, to my patients because that helps me, um, do a better job at guiding their art session. Yeah. But I did have one person and she had an eating disorder and she'd already done art at her, you know, eating disorder treatment. So she knew it. And so she did not share what she just said, I have childhood trauma and she never shared one fact about mm -hmm. what was 
what happened. I knew nothing, literally nothing. I knew she had an eating disorder and there was childhood trauma. And we still had two very effective art sessions. So, you know, if someone is literally so traumatized, they can't even speak about it. Right. It can still work. So you specialize in female, like women therapy and sex therapy. And so that kind of one, I want to bring that into this, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's like 83% of women at some point in their life will be sexually assaulted or, you know, something like that. Um, and then that always, of course, even if we don't think it does carries over into our sex life with our partners. Um, so it's combining the two together, um, and then working on this therapy, I would imagine that this would open up your, um, ability to be intimate Mm -hmm. and not identify sex in a, in a way that is painful. Yeah. So I will tell you that, um, in the in the art that i provide by far the people who have had the best results i mean instant life changing um soul clearing are people with sexual abuse sexual assault rape anything of that nature i don't know why but I could not be happier because these women deserve to heal. Everyone deserves to heal. But again, as you said, the way it impacts their current sexual relationships, emotional relationships, romantic relationships, ability to trust is, you know, pretty high. And so, um, you know, I've had, I've worked with a lot of women around, um, you know, uh, you know, rape in college or again, childhood sexual abuse, whether it was once or ongoing and by changing those images, by calming the sensations in the body, as they think about those images and then creating, you know, the positization, the way they want to remember it, what they want to hold in their mind is revolutionary. And they describe that their entire relationship, if they're in one with their partner is very different. So someone came to me who I'd actually worked with for many years before, and she came back and said, I am completely triggered when my husband touches me in the bed at night, even if he's just touching me and I can't stand it. I'm completely dysregulated. I'm hyperventilating. I'm, you know, sweating and I literally am overcome. And so we worked on a, on a rape in college. I think we did two to three sessions on it. And, you know, she describes just feeling so much more relaxed in her body and able to experience more pleasure. And again, as you said, right, that combines trauma work, Mm -hmm. sex therapy, relationship issues, all in one. And the, the satisfaction, the delight, the, the just pure joy I feel when I'm watching someone literally move in minutes from practically having a panic attack in my office in front of me to two, three, five minutes later, certainly by the end of the session, smiling, relaxed. I mean, they say, I feel lightness in my body. I can actually watch the curve of their smile go up. And it's so funny. Here I go again with my goosebumps. I can't. Right. I was going to ask about- you, how does that feel? I mean, just as somebody like my work in this life now has become um, about healing, right? Healing myself and help, helping, helping others heal. And so as you talk, I think to myself, God, what a gift. Such a gift to give and such a gift to provide. Right. Again, psychotherapy for me is an art and a joy. But this art, is so beyond that. It is sacred, beautiful. And as you see, I can't talk about it without goosebumps. So I am fighting back tears occasionally in sessions because when you watch someone heal, uh, what more could you want for someone? Um, And I do think this is where I'd love to talk about sort of how art is so great for therapists. You know, I am so encouraging a therapist to get 
trained in accelerated resolution therapy um, because it prevents burnout because you're not actually then continuing to hear stories of trauma over and over and over again. And for trauma therapists, there's a lot of burnout. Right. That's very interesting that you would say that. Yeah. The secondary trauma, hearing this over and over again, different stories. And I would imagine that it's hard when people don't move forward. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So I would think that, you know, you, you want to put your best effort in there and people are doing the work and they're not moving forward. That would be very hard. It's very hard. And, you know, there's a lot of um, feelings of inadequacy as a therapist at times. I mean, we're human beings and it doesn't feel good when people aren't necessarily getting better or um, at the rate we would wish they would get better or whatever it is. And so um, providing art prevents burnout. Um, and it allows for kind of a differentiation in my day. So, you know, if I have a day where I'm seeing, you know, seven patients and for our talk therapy, having a few art patients kind of, um, scheduled in allows me to show up differently. And so, um, it's still very hard work. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's you, you have to pay exquisite attention, exquisite watching eyes, you know, watching, I mean, it's, it's a lot, but it's a different kind of attention and it's a different part of my brain that I'm accessing. And I love that flexibility. Um, and so the variety has been great and, um, and the personal satisfaction, the feeling of I'm a good therapist, um, you know, it's just heightened so much. And I mean, if, if, if I'm clear, it's not that I'm such a great therapist. It's that art works. Well, so I would say that that would be a moment where we could rephrase it and say that you are a great therapist because you learned a new tool that is helpful to people. Right. So I like that better. Yeah. Right. (laughs) That's my therapy talking right there. (laughs) Um, so are, is there resistance to learning this tool? Resistance to learning it. Um, or other therapists. You know, I think, I think for therapists and patients, there's a too good to be true. And here's my plug for Lainey Rosenzweig book on art and how she created it and, and, and her story. And it's called too good to be true. Why? Because that's what everyone says about it. And I get it. We are very suspicious of anything that's quick, fast, and easy, especially when it comes to therapy, right? The work, the work, the years of work. And I am not saying that's not also true because it is. But if this can move the needle, if this kind of therapy can move the boulder, then you can do the harder work. So what I really also sort of encourage people is, first of all, um, you can get trained and you can start doing providing art immediately. And so you yourself can see, you know, um, how it works. Mm -hmm. Um, I also suggest that uh, therapists go and have an art session themselves because that's how I got trained. I was a patient. I said, I need to do this immediately. I want everyone to feel as good as I feel right now. Um, but I do think it's a suspicion and, and patients come in with that suspicion and I go, great. Of course you're skeptical. Why wouldn't you be right? You'd almost be scared if they weren't right. (laughs) That's what I say to them. I say, I'd be worried about you if you were all in now. And I always say you can be skeptical, but you have to be willing to believe something works. And so often what will happen is, you know, I'll work with someone and they come in, you know, I had someone the other day and her, she has a chronic illness and her knee was throbbing. And, you know, I said, okay, well, you know, let's work on that. And within 60 seconds, she kind of looked at me and she said, my knee doesn't hurt. And, you know, she (laughs) said it just like that. I said, yeah, I know. And she said, what just happened? And I said, art works. 
So well, it's hard I, to believe sometimes. Yeah. And I, I think that we forget that, um, and this kind of goes back to the chronic illnesses and stuff that our emotions cause a lot of our, our physical issues, right? Yep. Um, everybody wants to feel better as far as like not be depressed and stuff, but you know, one, I feel like depression is caused when your physical body doesn't really work the way that it's supposed to, which is because you're holding on to these emotions and these, and all of these different things. So it feels like it would be, um, God, I I love to use the word God sent, you know, like to people who are um, just suffering physically and mentally and emotionally. And I think almost everybody is at some point in their life. A hundred percent. And I think if you think you're going to get through this life without those, those things, you're kidding yourself. And it's going to be a tough life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all Mm -hmm. struggle. That is our common humanity. We all struggle. Some is invisible. Some is out there in public. Um, You know, some is, you know, longstanding. Some happened in childhood, but we all struggle. And that's why we're so inherently connected Mm -hmm. through struggle. It doesn't mean I have to know your exact struggle to be empathic with you, to be there for you. But, you know, this is why I love Brene Brown's work, right? Because it's not that I have to have, you know, let's say, you know, you said your mother-in-law has passed. So it maybe my mother-in-law hasn't passed away, but I know sadness, I know grief. And so my job is to tap into those feelings inside of me and that's empathy. Mm-hmm. Without letting them overwhelm and take over so that the other person doesn't get to have their their moment too, right? I feel like that happens quite a bit where mm-hmm. it's like when people are talking and they're like, yeah, my, you know, so-and-so just passed away and I'm so sad. And oh yeah, when my dog died, I was, and it's like, shut up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, comparing, you know, it's not the suffering Olympics. Um, yes. We don't get anywhere with comparing suffering or one upping, you know, suffering, um, you know, uh, that that doesn't help. That doesn't, you know. And so again, for me, you know, sometimes the only thing I can do is just hold space and be present yeah. and breathe with the person. Um, you know, we can't fix people's problems. That's right. you know, a as a therapist, that's not our job. Um, but also just as a friend, you know, there's so many things we can't change for people. It, it, you know, something hard has happened and they're in it and we can't change it for them. And it's not about saying the right thing, right? It's about being there, being open and, um, you know, fully present. Yeah. Yeah. Holding space. That's how I feel. Um, So I'm smiling for the podcast that can't physically see me. I'm smiling because now I have your goosebumps. This is amazing. Yeah. So, so interesting. Um, So I would imagine because that you have to watch the person, this must be an in-person session or is this Mm -hmm. also done um, virtually? So, you know, I think art therapists do it differently. Um, I do provide virtual uh, art. Um, sessions. And uh, what's kind of cool is I've been able to, I've actually worked with two people where they've done both in person and virtual. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten to get their feedback and they actually both have said that they find it equally effective. Mm -hmm. Now they both happen to prefer in person and I prefer in person, but uh, over virtual any day and every day. That is my preference. I want to be connected. I want to be able to see the whole person, the whole body. So it's, um, it's, it's equally effective. I just don't enjoy it quite as much. Um, but it works because it's, you know, the eye movements. Right. And it's one less excuse for people. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I will just build up a bunch of excuses of why we can't go to the therapist. We can't take an hour out of our day. And by the time we drive there and blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. And so I, right. You don't need um, the in-person thing to be a barrier. Um, And I think it's, you know, in terms of resources, you know, um, uh, everyone can find an art therapist trained near you in your state. You just have to go to art worksnow.com or accelerated resolution therapy.com same same website and you can search for art practitioners by state Um, you can search by name 
And I think it was about 6,000 art practitioners around the world. Um, it's, uh, you know, evidence-based. There's lots of research going on uh, about art. Um, and I always sort of say it's just like, a, a, it's just a little bit, it's a few steps behind EMDR in terms of kind of the marketing right. and the, the name recognition. Um, but right. it's, it's really important you know, to know both. And um, they are a little bit different. I think that can be helpful to also understand. Um, they're both, they both use eye movements, mm -hmm. um, but uh, art is more, has more of a specific protocol, whereas EMDR can kind of be meander a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, art is very predictable. Uh, it has a cadence. It uses lots of imagery and wordplay, and um, it's it's more predictable. And so, what I love about that is that after the first session, the patient knows what's going to happen, and mm -hmm. I find that their anxiety goes down. Right. And um, the other thing is that it is it's faster, so it's one to five sessions. EMDR can be a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, and while EMDR focuses more on beliefs and, you know, thoughts and feelings, art focuses on images and sensations. Um, so those are some of the, the differences. Yeah. Um, and again, I think, you know, each of them can be highly effective. Um, you just need to think about kind of what might work best for you or try both. I think like, so I did try, like I said, the EMDR and for me, it didn't work only because I didn't want to continue to put the time into it. Um, and so I, I like what you're saying about art, because if you see, if you see results quicker, not that we need a quick fix, but we do, that's what society is like now. Right. We want everything instantly, but, yeah. um, if you, if I saw results with the EMDR, I would have continued to go to it. Right. But because for me, it didn't, I didn't see within two or three sessions, I didn't see like a big, you know, significant difference. I was like this, maybe this is hocus pocus. Right. And, mm -hmm. and obviously there's research showing it's not, but that's how I felt and how I felt is then how I responded. Right. So, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I think I can't imagine that the world without this now that I know. Yeah. Yeah. How can, yeah, yeah. It's and really so we need to get it out there. We need to get it out there. That's why I'm here. That's, yeah. that's why I'm here. I literally can't stop talking about it. I just can't, you know, uh, um, when you find something that, you know, lights you up from the inside out, and then you see it literally heal people in front of your eyes. Again, I, I'm, I don't want to cry, but I, um, I do. I, cry. Eyes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I cry a lot. I cry when I talk about it. Um, I, um, and again, I just think what's so important, you know, is you're looking at, it helps so many different things. So I want to give you a little example of that because I think it's helpful to sort of understand. So art works on physical pain. I had a woman come in, she had, uh, had an accident an injury and had hurt her toe. It hurt every single day for two years. We did one 60 minute session where we sort of processed what had happened when she'd had the toe injury. And it's uh, seven months later. And from that moment, she's never had one moment of pain in her toe, not one. Wow. And I keep, I'll, I'll check in with her because I still see her for regular talk therapy. And I'll, I'll say, so that toe thing, are, are we sure it's, there's nothing there? And she goes, nope. And she just moves on because it's so automatic for her. She doesn't even doubt it. Um, so we're talking about, okay, so that's physical pain. Right. Then we're looking at to, I think another side of it is, you know, I want to respond different. I worked with a, a, a person who every single time she interacted with her mother, she would binge eat every time, just mm. automatic. Yeah. And so, you know, we worked on that. And, you know, she went and visited her mother. And for the first time in as long as she could remember, she had a pretty good interaction with her mother. But more importantly, because you can't control another person, she didn't binge eat. And think about the freedom of that. Right. Think about even having that experience once. 
And then you're capable of it. You know, you're, you're always capable, but you know, then you know, you're capable. And so then that's going to just, you know, lend itself more and more. And that's, what that brings me to, I don't mean to interrupt you is that when she would binge eat, I would imagine it then brought shame. Right. And so then she's sitting in shame. So then she's sitting in guilt and then she's sitting in self-loathing and then she, you know, I mean, I, it's like such a, uh, 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 what is down like an, uh, what is that? Like when it spiral? Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a downward spiral. Yeah. A downward spiral just from her visiting her mom. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and I always say, I mean, you just, you just go right into the shame hole and it's really hard to get out. And so it may not be what we, again, we can't control other people, her mother. I mean, her mother might've still been difficult, but to feel that she could respond differently and not need to harm herself yes. afterwards. Yes. Right. Yes. Cause that's the self harm. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so again, you know, there's something like that and, and then anything in between that same patient, her entire life, she's in her fifties. Every time she looked in the mirror, she would have horrible, horrible thoughts. You're ugly, you're fat, you're worthless, you're nothing. We did one 60 minute session and, um, you know, months later she had changed her entire self-talk, mm-hmm. changing your self-talk about your body image. I mean, think how revolutionary that is for women, men mm-hmm. too, but you know, for women, if you can do that, right. In that you know, almost a couple sessions. One- Makes me wonder if you're going to get kickback from all of the companies who make money on shaming us about our body. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I would just... love that. Would be awesome. I right. would love to see that. Yeah, <laughs> that I mean, would be satisfying if it works so well that you know, big big companies are like pissed off because you no longer can sell them on you know all these other tools that make them feel like you know, well, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Um, um, can I give you one other example? Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I'm on, I'm on a roll. Okay. So this is one of my favorite, um, stories uh, or experiences with art. Um, I had a woman come in and her brother had died five years earlier. And every time she thought of him, she would become very sad because she felt a ton of guilt that she was not able to be with him in the hospital when he died, she was in another state and she has really not been able to let go of that. So it's been a traumatic, it was a traumatic death for her. And, um, we did a session on it. Um, and she just changed, you know, again, she made it positive. She, you cannot change the facts of anything. Obviously she couldn't change that. Her brother is dead. And she wasn't there. Yeah. And she wasn't there. Those are the facts, but she changed the way she wanted to store it in her brain Mm -hmm. and is completely clear that now when she thinks of her brother, she has a huge smile on her face and feels a complete sense of peace and um, calm in her entire body. And I've seen her when she talks about it and she just says, I just feel happy now. It doesn't mean there's not grief. She right. still doesn't have a, a brother who's alive and with her. So you're not, you, you don't change facts and you don't change that there is grief. You change your relationship with the images of it, the relationship with the memory. What I love about that too, is that so many people who have passed away, uh, you know, either unexpectedly or painfully or whatever, the loved ones only remember them for that. And they forget about all the other stuff, not intentionally, but because that's the thing that stood out. Right. And so all of the other beautiful life that they had with that person before is remembered by the fact that they died too early. They suffered when they died, you know, all of these different things. And so it feels like it gives you back that beautiful space of remembering the person for who they were, not for the way they passed or for that last experience or for, you know, maybe missing them and not being there for them and sitting in that guilt all the time. It opens up this space to have that um, happiness back. It feels like. Uh, I I think that is such a, 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 just really wonderfully said, that's exactly right. So that instead of, you know, hyper-focusing on kind of 
an image or a what you know a, something that happened that was probably more like a snapshot of that person's life or a snapshot of your relationship with that person right. you know maybe you had a fight that morning and then the person got into a car accident and that's what you fixate on right and so not only is the person you love gone but you spend can spend the rest of your life punishing yourself so it sets you free to love that person again in your heart. I think that's so beautifully. I love that you pointed that out. That's so it, true. I mean, I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes because the, the, um, so many people that I talk to have lost somebody and they, they sit in this horrible space of just not being able to move forward because of it. I mean, that's right. That is crazy. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for our conversation because it's so funny how I'm, and this is me getting kind of into my woo-woo space, but it's so funny to me how the universe works because, uh, you and I had a, a podcast scheduled a while ago and I was not able to attend it. And, um, today I didn't really know what to expect. Obviously I talked to a lot of psychotherapists. And so it was like, is it going to be similar to the other podcasts that I've had with psychotherapists and they're great tools and all of that different stuff. But sometimes we want, we want to offer different alternatives. And I was not expecting to be honest you, with you, this conversation. In fact, when we started, I said, you know, let's talk about the sex therapy and the, the women and all of that stuff. And then that is all of that stuff matters, but it's all really very well tied to this. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's all related. And, you know, and, and that's what I love is again, um, you know, there, there are two types of people who do art. There's the person who comes in and says, you know, I want to work on my trauma. My therapist said that you can help me with this thing and, you know, brief time. Great. Love those people. But what I also love is having more tools in my tool belt, you know, mm -hmm. to help a person that I maybe have seen for several years, you know, or many years where I say, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but I, I noticed that you're really stuck in this one place. So let's attack that with art. And that's how I feel is like, mm -hmm. let's attack it. Let's get at this thing. Um, and so I've also been having really good success with people I've seen for many years and we just need to move that goddamn one thing out of the right. way, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because and then they, they have access to get past it. Right. Sorry. To yeah. Me. And it's really cool too. I mean, you know, art, it, it's also important to understand that it, it's just a tool to, um, to also just calm, you know, your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So someone might come in and, you know, they're a regular talk therapy patient, but they're really dysregulated because they just, you know, you know, had someone, you know, flip them the bird when they were driving. Right. And they're agitated and they're, you know, they're angry and their heart is pounding and they've got a lump in their throat and I'll, you know, they'll sit down and I say, well, sounds like it might be hard for you to kind of get into the session. Like, let's just do some eye movements for a while. And we just clear the sensations and then we move on. So the, the next question is such a beautiful gift to the world. Um, what is being done to, I mean, obviously you being on here is going to, you know, hopefully bring some awareness. It's, I think it's kind of a slow build with art. Um, and I do think that, you know, if, you know, it's almost like tapping, like mm -hmm. I saw pink the other day, uh, there's a clip of her talking about how she uses tapping mm -hmm. and, you know, that is going to be what allows more access right. to tapping. Right. So there's always a part of me that's like, okay, where's the well-known person right. Right. who's Who going to come my way? So they can say this works, you know, right. and, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, that is sort of how our society works right it now. Is. Right. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, I mean, word of mouth, right. Of and, and that's yeah. why I have testimonials on my website mm. because I can't explain it sometimes. And everybody uses the word magic. Mm. So are you going to go see a therapist who says it's magic? Right. Not necessarily. Yeah. Now, right. the good news is it's evidence-based right. magic. And so that those two things, I think, are what make will make the difference is it's evidence-based and it's magic. 
I would, however, go to see, get this. I would go do this if somebody came to me and they told me about their experience and they said their experience was magic, right? Yes. So, uh, so I think the word can be used different ways um, mm-hmm. because I absolutely think that um, if 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 somebody I know and trust um, and said, you know, I did this and it really helped me with X, Y, Z, I would be like, where do I sign up to at least talk about it? Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I've been thinking actually about one of my next steps is, you know, again, I've gotten testimonials from, from patients that's on my website, but really asking somebody to either go on video or just audio yeah. even and, and talk about it. I mean, obviously confidentiality issues, sure. but I'll tell you, I have several people who say they'll do anything to help me promote it. You know, they'd be willing to do anything. They'd be, you know, um, I have a woman recently, um, I have a, there's a, you know, a a news, a local news station that said they'd like to do something on it. And, you know, again, because of confidentiality, it it feels tricky for me. And I had a a patient who said, absolutely, I'll do whatever I want. Do you want a picture? Do you want my full name? (laughs) um, Do they want my address? (laughs) You know, because she believes in it that much. Yeah. And um, and we do need people like that, right? We need people who can actually say this worked for me mm-hmm. and not just this worked for me, but this worked for me. And I've tried, you know, the six other things right. throughout my life, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's also important. It's people lose hope. Yeah. They lose hope. They believe this is, you know, almost like this, you know, and again, I believe in a degree of acceptance, right? I mean, of course, this is a part of your story or this is a part of what you struggle with. But again, I always tell people, I do not support your suffering. Mm -hmm. I will not sit back and watch you suffer when you don't have to. So I get that you have, you know, mental illness or that depression runs in your family and this is a predisposition, but there are levels of depression. Mm-hmm. There's living with it. There's thriving with it. And mm-hmm. then there's, I can't get out of bed and I'm under, uh, you know, and I won't support that. And I'll help you with that. Well, and I feel like those are two separate things because, because they're two separate things. And then they're together. There's the mental illness that runs in the family. And then there are the events in the life that trigger the mental illness to make it worse. Right. right. Yep. And so you can, the one tool you do get is the opportunity to change those triggers and work through that. You can't change what your family gave you, but you can change everything else beyond that. Right. So we can empower ourselves. I feel like it's a tool for empowerment. It, I think that people need more alternatives mm-hmm. I really believe that people need more alternatives that are quicker Mm -hmm. because of the amount of suffering we have right now going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I think it would be a tool to help people from suicide and things like that. I mean, I, because people who commit suicide oftentimes feel like there's no way out and they don't just like out of the blue say, I'm going to kill myself. These are people who have suffered for a long time, oftentimes have tried many different tools and it hasn't worked for them. And so, I mean, it can, it can be brought forward in so many different things. It can be brought forward with the vets. Like you kind of talked about a little bit. I mean, the stuff that they see and what they go through, um, anything that's traumatic, Yeah. And there's a lot of research and a lot of partnership um, between, um, you know, Lainey Rosenzweig and and her um, center um, uh, around getting getting studies going. There are lots of uh, places that are using art in there. Um, You know, as I mentioned, there was a treatment center for an eating disorder. They're using it. Um, There are a lot of retreats now, Mm. Um, some of the, you know, warrior wellness type places are using it. So it is being used. In fact, Mm -hmm. mostly what we're seeing is around the uh, veteran community and more sort of medical settings, actually. And so that is incredibly exciting. But the other thing is get trained. Therapists, please go to Artworks now, get trained. Lainey actually has, I think every single month, an hour and a half introduction to art that's free, virtual. So go attend that, learn about it, learn what it means to get trained and do it. Have more tools in your tool belt. 
feel better about your capacity to help people. Um, and, you know, like anything else, I think it's so important to say to, you know, patients or people considering art, the worst thing that happened is you tried something new for maybe one to two hours and it didn't work. Right. Zero harm. And here's where I actually want to say one other thing. The, the art, the name is really important to understand because it's accelerated, which we understand fast, but resolution is a very important word. The way the the protocol is set up is that there is a resolution Mm -hmm. at the end of every session. So you are not, unlike talk therapy and some other therapies, going in, opening yourself up, talking, sobbing about your trauma, really getting triggered, and then walking out the door and you have to wait a week. Right. There is a resolution. We ask the person how they feel in the beginning and we ask them how they feel at the end on a Mm -hmm. scale. It always goes down. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done, I don't know, maybe 150 hours now of art. You know, I lost track, obviously, but um, I've been doing it a lot. And I think once someone's number didn't go down once, one time. And of course, that's that person who falls into that third category of not quite being ready to change. I don't even mean willing, just ready. Right. Um, and so you're always going to go down in terms of the intensity of the negative feelings. Now, that intensity and how far you go down obviously varies. Right. But um, it is not uncommon at the end of a session for someone to be at a zero, which is the intensity of the feeling they felt or the feelings they felt at the beginning of the session. Completely a zero. Gone. Completely gone. So you said artworks, artworksnow.com is where yes. we could find a practitioner. Um, yes, you can go to, uh, our, uh, sorry, artworksnow.com mm-hmm. or is-art.com. That's the International Society for Accelerated Resolution Therapy. They also have a directory. So either place, um, that's more of the professional organization that the therapists join. Um, But um, you really, I mean, and, you know, Lainey's got an amazing TED Talk. There are actually two TED Talks on art. Mm -hmm. And there are also, you know, videos from people who've experienced art, like you said, the people who know that it works. And those are on there under, I think, videos. Um, And there, there's an entire, um, you know, there's links to the research. It depends, you know, some people really want to read research before they do something. Some people don't care and just say, let's give it a go. And whatever you are, you can, you know, you can find that research on the website and And it's really impressive. And Lainey has a book too good to be true. Yes. Too good to be true, which really talks about her history and how she founded art and, you know, what she loves about it. And it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting that there's a book on it now. Love it. Well, thank you for coming on and sharing this with us. Um, I look forward to a follow-up. Yes. Yeah. I think that that would be fun to do a follow-up. Um, and then if people just want to get to know you a little bit, how do they Mm -hmm. get to know you? So they can go to my website, which is just my name, brookebraylove.com. And then I'm on Instagram and Facebook at Brooke Bray Love Psychotherapy. And um, you can find me on TikTok and LinkedIn, any, any one of those places. Okay. And I will provide those links in our comments um, in the description of our podcast. And I really thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.